Hi, my name is Sean McMahon, and I'm the chair of screen scoring at Berklee College of Music in Boston. Orchestration is one of my favorite topics in film music, and I've spent most of my career as an orchestrator. Some of my orchestration credits include Spider-Man 3, Ghost Rider, Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer, and many more. In this episode of Virtual Orchestration, I'll be talking about orchestrating for strings specifically. You'll walk away with at least three digestible, bite-sized takeaways. You'll learn first how to balance string voicings, second, when to use string octave doublings versus unisons, and third, how to voice string flourishes, otherwise known as runs or sweeps. Let's get started. Most media composers write in a digital audio workstation, but hire an orchestrator to get their compositions out of the DAW and onto a score page so that the orchestra can record. Composers frequently don't have the time or expertise, or sometimes both, to orchestrate their own music for a score. And there is no button you can simply press that will magically convert a composer's mock-up into a finished orchestration. I like to think of orchestrators as interpreters or translators. Orchestrators interpret the intentions of a composer by looking at their MIDI data and listening to the mock-up, and they translate it for the orchestra. Much of the orchestration job is making many small decisions and problem solving for the composer. For example, a composer may write a three-note chord for four French horns. So what do you do with the fourth horn? Do you have it sit out on the chord or double an existing note? Or play a new note entirely? Another example is adding phrase markings, dynamics, and articulations to a score. That information is not explicitly implied in a composer's mock-up. I want to first introduce you to something called the Z-clef. The Z-clef technique was popularized by Hollywood orchestrator Scott Smalley in his Art of Orchestration seminars he taught years ago. The Z-clef is a tool you can use to ensure the strings are balanced. By balanced, I mean that no voices stick out in an unnatural way and that no voices are buried either. Even though the strings have excellent dynamic control at all ranges, they all have the same tendency to project more as the range gets higher. The lowest notes and highest notes of each string instrument fall in approximately the same place in their respective clefs. Their lowest notes fall one to two ledger lines below the staff, and their highest about five to six ledger lines above the staff. The Z-clef is a fictitious clef that shows the placement of each instrument's note in a voicing within its common or default clef. When a voicing is plotted on the Z-clef, the closer the notes are clustered together, the more balanced the voicing will sound. To achieve optimal balance, all the notes within the voicing should fall within a range of a sixth when plotted on the Z-clef. Let's take a look at this example which depicts a C major voicing for strings with some of the instruments divided. At first glance, there seems to be nothing wrong with this voicing. Now, let's plot this chord on the Z-clef to see where each instrument's note falls relative to the others. The closer the notes fall together on the Z-clef, the more optimal the balance and blend will be. Remember, for optimal balance, keep the voicing clustered within a sixth on the Z-clef. To use the Z-clef, simply transfer the notes where they fall in their common or default clef to a new stave. Always use alto clef for violas and bass clef for cellos and basses when you plot the pitches on the Z-clef. This is essential. For the contrabass, which is a transposing instrument, the Z-clef always makes use of the written or transposed pitch, not the sounding or concert pitch. This is an important distinction as the Z-clef's accuracy to predict balance breaks if the sounding pitch is used for the contrabass. There's a spread of a 14th interval from top to bottom, which greatly exceeds a sixth. This voicing will sound quite unbalanced. The instruments towards the top of the Z-clef, such as the contrabasses and violas, will tend to stick out in an undesired way. This next example shows a more balanced solution to the same chord, C major. When this voicing is transferred to the Z-clef, all the notes are tightly clustered within a sixth. This voicing is much more effective because it's balanced there are no notes that stick out or that are buried. It's not always possible, or even desirable, to employ the Z-clef and keep all the notes of the voicing contained within a sixth. Sometimes it's impractical to be faithful to it for an entire piece, or even an entire phrase, but it's a good starting point when first learning how to compose for strings. Don't think of the Z-clef as a rule, rather think of it as a guideline. Now, let's take a look at the next example, which provides some musical context to better understand the Z-clef. This is a cue from Christopher Young's score to Ghost Rider. 
The strings function as pads that support the nylon guitar lead line. The strings are voiced below the guitar melody so as not to compete with it in terms of range. The first four bars of the strings, the downbeats only, are plotted on the Z-clef below the cellos. Notice how the voicing is clustered within a fifth. Let's have a listen. Now let's take a look at when to use octave doublings and when to use unisons for the strings. When composers want to make a bold statement, often they assign all of the strings, excluding the contrabasses, to carry the melody. The question then is how to voice them. Do you spread the strings out across multiple octaves, or do you assign them to the same octave? The answer is it depends. If you want projection, meaning to stand out and be heard, the best solution is to spread the melody across multiple octaves. But if you want tone weight, a thicker, meatier, more robust sound with more body, the best choice is to assign them to the same octave. There's a good example for doubling a melody in different octaves, and that's John Williams' score for E.T. When E.T.'s theme is introduced in this example, violins 1 and 2 are playing in unison. The violas double violins 1 and 2 down an octave, while the cellos double violins 1 and 2 down two octaves. In total, the melody is carried in three separate octaves, and that really helps it to project. Notice how the melody voicing adheres extremely closely to the Z-clef principle. The voicing is clustered in thirds throughout, creating optimal balance. Now let's have a listen. Now let's talk about a concept called the Violin 2 Shadow. Often, when the first violins soar high into the ledger lines of the treble clef, the second violins don't follow in unison. Instead, the second violins double a passage down one octave from the first violins. This, in and of itself, violates the Z-clef principle because the goal is to keep voicings clustered within a sixth or as closely as possible. But in cases where the second violins double the first violins down an octave, the second violins are not meant to be heard, or at least heard well. I know that may sound a little odd and counterintuitive. In these cases, the second violins are meant to support the first violins and act as its shadow. When using the Violin 2 shadow technique, Violin 1 tends to dominate, and that's okay. The reason for using the Violin 2 shadow technique is to help the first violins play in tune. Consider this technique when the first violins are playing sustained passages above high E, the third ledger line above the treble clef. Take a look at this example from a different excerpt using the same melody from E.T. The melody is played in four octaves by violins 1 and 2, violas, and cellos. Each group is assigned its own octave, including violins 1 and 2. This causes violin 1 and 2 to be separated by an octave. The result is that violin 2 gets somewhat lost in terms of balance, and violin 1 tends to dominate. The first note of the melody has also been transferred to the Z-clef here. Notice how violin 1 is an octave or more above any of the other notes. This will cause violin 1 to really stick out, which is okay because it's the top octave of the melody and it's meant to sing. Let's take a listen. Let's discuss string unisons now. When you want more tone weight on a line, Orchestrating the strings in unison is a great choice. However, it causes imbalances within the Z-clef, and the lower instruments, such as the cellos, tend to dominate the tone color. An example of this is Gustav Holt's Jupiter from his iconic suite to the planets. Each downbeat of each measure has been transferred to the Z-clef. Notice the spread of an octave plus a sixth from the highest note to the lowest. The cellos tend to dominate because they are playing so much higher than the violins in their respective ranges. Holst doubles the string melody with horns at the unison, further coloring the tone. Also notice how much thicker the timbral quality is compared to the ET example. An orchestral flourish, also known as a run or sweep, is a short gesture, usually just one to three beats in duration. 
the notes are comprised of some sort of scale, and the flourish climbs the scale in stepwise motion and ends on an accented target note, which is frequently a downbeat. Because flourishes are, by their very nature, quick and dense with notes, they favor octave doublings for projection, as opposed to unisons for tone weight. Having the timbre too heavy or thick will act like an anchor on the flourish, which needs to provide forward motion. Always try to orchestrate a flourish in at least two or more octaves so it projects. Coupling a flourish, let's say by harmonizing it in thirds, tends to decrease the propulsion and forward motion. When orchestrating a flourish for strings, it's usually a good idea to stay faithful to the Z-clef principle. Take a look at this example. This example assigns violin 1 to the top octave of a flourish, violin 2 to the octave below, violas 2 octaves below violin 1, and cellos 3 octaves below violin 1. This makes for 4 octaves and creates a spread of a tenth in the Z-clef. Obviously, this isn't very balanced. By looking at the Z-clef, you can see that violin 1 is an outlier and will dominate because it sits an octave or more above the rest. To correct the imbalance of the previous example, violins 1 and 2 should be reorchestrated in unison, with the violas down one octave from the violins and the cellos down two octaves from the violins. This will create a much more balanced sweep, as seen here. Notice how the Z-clef voicing is contained within a third. Well, that brings us to the end of this video. Have you ever written for live strings as opposed to your samples? If so, what was your experience like? What difficulties did you encounter? And what did you learn? Just let me know in the comments, and I'll see you in another episode of Virtual Orchestration.